Okay, well, thank you very much, Arthur, and uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to see so many people uh, having signed in this morning. I've called this an expert guide to presenting with impact because I'm sure as market researchers, you have all given a great many presentations in your careers. And as Arthur said, as a client side person, I've sat through an awful lot of presentations and some of them have been good, a few have been great, a lot of them have been okay. So when you go into a presentation, you want your clients to be impressed and excited by the quality of your research and the depth of your insight. You know perfectly well an effective presentation can be the key to winning a new client and certainly the key to convincing a client to come back to you again. So how can you turn a decent presentation into a great one? I hope today to give you some practical ideas to help you do just that. Now, of course, in an hour, this can only be a taster. So if you're interested and would like to learn more, I do offer training and I have got a special offer for ICG members, which I'll talk to you about at the end. So let's assume what I hope will be the case when you're going in to give a presentation to the client you have actually got some interesting and relevant material to present to them. And you've got lots of charts and tables and you've got your list of key findings and you've thought about the insights and the recommendations that you want to give to your client. Well, facts and figures are really important, of course, but they only engage the mind and they only convince on an intellectual level. If you actually want to persuade people to buy into what you're telling them and to act on it, you also need to engage their emotions. So how can you do that? Now, there's two sides to this. What I call the presentation toolkit and the storybook. The toolkit is all about your presentation style, how you use your voice and your body language and your gestures and your energy, all the skills at your command to make your presentation really lively and interesting for the people listening to it. Now, that's quite hard for me to teach you over the phone uh, and harder for you to learn because those are skills that need to be done for real, practical session, lots of opportunities to try things out and experiment. So I'm only going to touch fairly briefly on that side of things today and just give you a few ideas to think about. And if that whets your, whets your appetite for more, I'll be more than happy to uh, provide you with more. The storybook is about how you structure the presentation. And what I suggest you do is start with what authors would call the hook the opening line that catches your audience's interest straight away. Good example is the opening line of George Orwell's 1984, which you may know. It was a cold, bright day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Immediately, we know this isn't the world that we're familiar with and we want to know more about it. Why are the clocks striking 13? Then you need to move on to tell your story. Thinking of your presentation as a story you're telling helps you develop the theme with a nice logical flow, makes it easy for people to follow and makes the message much clearer. But more than that, a well-told story using lots of nice colorful language and imagery keeps the hearers listening, keeps people riveted. They'll want to know how the story ends. So, you come to the end, hopefully it's a happy ending, maybe it's not, and then you give the moral of the story, driving home your key message in a way that forces your audience to take notice and to act. Because unless a presentation brings about some kind of positive change for someone, then however polished and professionally presented it was, it was a waste of time. So what actually does help you to get the message across? You may well have seen this chart or something like it before. It's 
very often used, and I think probably overused. It's based on a piece of research from the 1960s by Professor Malavian. It's almost certainly been overinterpreted because what he was actually looking at was the signals people use to interpret the expression of positive or negative feelings. And in that situation, the words didn't count for very much. It was much more about the body language and the voice. In a business situation, I'm sure that the words are a lot more important than 7% of the message. But the body language and the voice and the tone are important. And I think the key message is really about consistency. The voice and the tone and the body language that you're using and your facial expressions convey your belief in what you're saying or not. So, for example, if we were lost in the middle of the forest and I said, well, I think this is the path we ought to take, how confident would you be about following me? How about if I said, I think this is the path we ought to take? Hope you can hear the difference. So, if you haven't got your words in line with what your body and your voice are saying, maybe your message isn't going to convince people if you don't sound as if you believe it yourself. So, let's take a little bit of a look in more detail at some of the tools you have in your presentation toolkit. And you need to think about using all of these in combination to build rapport with your audience to make your presentation really engaging and interesting and to make sure your points hit home. I've talked a lot already about body language. What's called high status body language gives people subliminal messages about confidence and authority. And I would suggest you go away and you have a look at some YouTube clips of good presenters and not so good presenters, good communicators, poor communicators. Obama, whatever you may think of his performance as a president, is a great presenter. If you look at clips of him speaking in public, you'll see that he stands very tall. He has an open posture. He carries his head high and he makes good eye contact, looking around, covering his whole audience. And there's also a, a basic stillness about him, which gives a sense of him being in control of the situation. He uses a lot of hand gestures, but they're always very strong and very focused and used to emphasise his points, not just fiddling about and distracting people. And I think there's a case for saying he was able to become president because he looked like a great leader even before he became one. Uh, whereas this guy is still having a few problems with that one. Then there's facial expressions. Facial expressions are hugely important to us as human beings. We're mind readers. We use other people's expressions as cues to what they're thinking, what they're feeling. And if you do a lot of face-to-face -face research, you're probably already using that as a tool to interpret what you're being told by your respondents. Do they really think what they're saying, how strongly do they feel about things, their expression will give them, give you a lot of cues to that. But using expressions in your presentation can make a big difference too. And it's worth just practicing in front of a mirror. Try saying something with a very still face and trying something with a very lively face, a very mobile face, and see how that can add so much more interest and impact to your words. And your facial expression actually makes a big difference, even if you're presenting on the phone, or like I'm doing today. One exercise I use in my training is to get a person to speak the same couple of sentences with and without facial expression, while another person listens with their eyes closed. And the listener can invariably tell, just from the voice, whether the speaker is using their face or not. 
it has that much impact. And then there's the voice. A lot of people are very confident speakers, but don't come over well because they speak all on one level in a very monotone voice. And after you've been speaking for a couple of sentences, it gets extremely boring. So think of your voice as an instrument. Just as in a piece of music, you need to vary the pitch of your voice. Speak in a higher tone and a lower tone. Vary the rhythm and the pace of what you're saying. By speeding up a little bit, you can make things sound much more exciting. By slowing down, you may be able to give the point more emphasis. And pauses can be really important as well. If I pause for a moment before the next sentence, I'll make sure you really listen to what I'm saying. And of course, the volume as well. Speaking louder or softer, varying that through the piece. And using all these changes in, in pitch and pace and volume can help you to focus attention on key words and phrases. Try listening to some of Churchill's speeches and see how effectively he was using rhythm and pauses there. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. It's very effective. Although, to be honest, I find his voice really a bit too monotone. But a great communicator nonetheless. Now, if you're going to be able to use your voice effectively, just like the player of a wind instrument, you need to learn to control your breath. It's far more effective if you can carry the strength of your voice through to the end of a thought than if your voice kind of trails off at the end of a sentence. If you think about a, an actor on stage playing Macbeth, how would it sound if he was speaking the soliloquy and saying, Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to that last syllable of recorded time, compared with saying, Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Much stronger. And underpinning a lot of these skills is the ability to relax in a stressful situation. If I tense up my body and my jaw as I'm speaking to you now, you can probably hear that's doing pretty terrible things to my voice and you can hear the tension coming through. And it's going to be doing really noticeable things to my posture and my unconscious body language as well. Because when we're tense, our bodies try to adopt a defensive position. Head tucked in, shoulders hunched, hands clenched. And that really doesn't look very confident. So knowing a few simple methods to help yourself relax before you start your presentation can make all the difference. And finally, there's the energy. The ability to harness and focus your energy is the key to making your presentations really exciting and motivating your audience. And just like relaxation, using energy is a skill that can be learned. So good use of all the tools in that toolkit can make you a much better presenter and give your presentation much, much greater impact. If you think about it, reading Shakespeare as you probably all had to do at school, I know I certainly did. The words can seem pretty flat and pretty meaningless. If you go and see a performance at the Globe or the Royal Shakespeare Theatre with actors using all their resources of voice and expression and movement, it's a totally different experience and the words really come alive. So that's a little bit about the toolkit. 
now I'm going to turn to the storybook, the words and the form that you use to get your message across. Now, before you even start a presentation, I suggest you take time to get clear in your own mind two things. Firstly, what did you want your audience to think or to do as a result of hearing it? Now, when I sat down to write this presentation, I had a very clear aim in view. I want to convince all of you that it would be a great idea to sign up for my masterclass. So everything I do in this presentation, I'm hoping, is going to help me achieve that aim. So next time you've got a presentation to give, try writing yourself a nice clear objective, something concrete and specific, use a strong expressive verb, really get clear in your head your personal focus for this presentation. Secondly, put yourself in your audience's shoes. What do they want to listen to you? Of course, there's going to be business reasons. There'll be the research objectives that you've been given. But think about them as people as well and think about why it matters to them personally, the what's in it for me question. Because each of those individuals in the room that you're going to be talking to is going to have their own agenda. You want to make sure that what you're telling them really matters to them and makes a difference to them because that will make them sit up and take notice. Now, I hope I'm right in the assumption I made. You've all dialed in today because you think there's a real benefit in improving your ability to give effective client presentations and that it's going to help you win new clients and keep the existing ones. So that gives me my focus on your needs. And the personal focus and the audience focus taken together give me the frame of reference for this presentation. So now I'm going to introduce you to Judy. She's a very experienced B2B market researcher and she's just completed her first project, a customer satisfaction survey, for a new client. So she really wants to make sure that the presentation that she's preparing now to give to the global sales and marketing director and his senior team is going to wow them. Because if it does, there's a good chance that there'll be more work coming her way. So if she was to write her objective, it would probably go something like this. I want to convince the clients I've done a brilliant job and they need to use me again. Then she's going to think about the client, what the company needs, but also what that sales director needs. Now, with a new client, that's a little bit tricky for her. She doesn't really know the people. She doesn't really know the company politics. She hopefully done a little bit of background research and found out a little bit about the, the company's strategy and performance. And she's had some discussions with the research manager during the project and tried to get a little bit of a feel for what the real background is. So, based on all of that, she reckons what he needs is something like, I really need to find some quick and easy ways to improve customer retention, otherwise my job might be on the line. So now Judy's got a good idea of what her presentation needs to deliver for her, and what the presentation needs to deliver for that key member of her client team. Trouble is, like most researchers, she's got a mass of complicated detailed charts and graphs and tables, and she knows that a lot of senior managers get quite impatient or even bored wading through all of that. From what she knows about this guy, it's likely he just wants to know what the problem is and how he can fix it. So the third thing Judy's going to ask herself is, what in these findings is likely to be really important for the client to know and what's going to be unexpected or dramatic? Once she's identified that, she can compose her opening, her hook. And it might be a statement along the lines of, customers love your products, but they get a much better service from your competitors. 
unless you can improve your service in three key areas, more customers are going to walk. Is the sales director going to be interested? You bet. She's got him hooked. He wants to know more. So now Judy needs to start developing her theme. She could do that in the conventional way. Recap the research objectives, talk a little bit about the background, describe the sample, go through the methodology, present all of those detailed charts, list the recommendations, or she could tell them a story. Now, I'm going to leave Judy working on her presentation for a bit and just talk a little bit about the power of storytelling. Stories are fundamental to how we make sense of the world. Every time we're telling someone about something that happened to us, we're telling a story. But more than that, every culture in its early years developed myths to explain why things are as they are. The Greeks told the myth of Persephone. She was the daughter of the earth goddess, the fertility goddess, but she was carried off by the god of the underworld, disappeared. And her mother went searching for her, and all the while that she was searching for her, she wasn't attending to her normal job. Nothing was growing. So eventually Zeus, the king of the gods, got involved and insisted to Hades that he had to give Persephone back. Unfortunately, while Persephone had been in the underworld, she'd eaten three seeds of a pomegranate. Just three seeds, but that was enough to tie her to the underworld. But the earth was dying, so Zeus came up with a compromise. Persephone would go back to her mother, but for three months of the year, she would have to return to Hades. So every year in that three months when Persephone is away, her mother is in mourning and nothing grows. And that's why we have winter. We also told stories about heroes, heroes like Hercules. An individual who has to overcome a series of challenges, defeat monsters or rivals, or go on an epic quest to achieve his goal. And these kind of stories had and still have tremendous power to move us. Why else do you think Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones are so very popular? So let me give you another example. If I asked all of you what you know about King Alfred the Great, You'll almost certainly, if you're English at least, say, he burnt the cakes. Actually, that probably never happened. So why was that story told and why has it persisted for over a thousand years? If I give you the facts and figures account of Alfred's life, it would go something like this. Alfred was born in about the year 849 at Wantage in Oxfordshire the youngest son of King Ethelwolf of Wessex by his first wife, Osborne. He came to the throne in 871 after the deaths of his three elder brothers, Ethelbald, Ethelbert and Ethelred. During this period, a Danish army under Guthrum had invaded Britain, landing in East Anglia in 865 and moving on to Wessex in 870. Early in 871, the Saxons were victorious at the Battle of Ashdown, but then suffered a serious defeats and I think by this point I've probably lost you. Or I could tell you a story, something like this. Alfred, King of the West Saxons, had been defending his kingdom against Danish invaders for most of his adult life. Now his kingdom was in ruins. A sudden attack in the depths of winter had left his army scattered and Alfred himself fleeing with a small group of friends to take refuge on the remote island of Athelney, deep in the Somerset marshes. In fact, when the dishevelled band took shelter with a peasant woman, she didn't even realise that Alfred was the king. Sitting by the hearth in that damp, dark hovel, Alfred might easily have despaired, but he didn't. 
Instead, he sat there deep in thought as to how he might rally his people and throw out the Danes. So deep in thought, he didn't even notice that the cakes which his hostess had left to bake on the hearthstone were now black and smoking. Well, not until she returned and boxed his ears for him. But nothing could dampen Alfred's mood. Soon all the men of Somerset and Wiltshire and Hampshire were flocking to join him, and together they won a great victory, forcing the Danes to sign a peace treaty that endured for the rest of Alfred's reign. The Danes were gone from Wessex, and they were gone for good. Now that's a story. Of course, Judy probably hasn't managed to come up with anything quite as dramatic as that. But she is going to present her results through storytelling. There's quite a lot of different ways of doing this, but this is the one that Judy's picked. She's going to tell her clients the stories of some of their typical customers. They'll be composite characters, but she'll give them names, she'll give them a picture, she'll give them a backstory. She'll describe their role and she'll describe their experiences of dealing with the client's company. So it might be Joe, the purchasing manager of a big manufacturing company. He knows that all of his internal customers agree that the client's products are the best, but is getting increasingly impatient with the poor service he's been getting. And he's said, every time there's a back order, it causes real problems and real headaches for him, and it's happening far too often. He's seriously thinking of having to switch suppliers. In this way, Judy can highlight all the issues her research has uncovered and demonstrate how they're making the customer feel, their frustration with the back orders, their annoyance at never being able to get hold of anyone in customer services who actually seems to know anything about their problem. And of course, she'll need to use the facts and figures as well to prove that what she's saying has some foundation, but it will be the story that really gets the message across. And of course, just telling the story isn't as powerful as letting the clients hear the customers say them. So she will illustrate the story, weaving real anecdotes, things that customers have told her, letting the customers speak in their own words, whether that's through quotes or through audio or through film clips, but personalising the issues. And most importantly, she will try and give the client some hope because what she's telling them is, is pretty bad news and what people really want to hear is that there is a solution, there is a way out. So she's going to identify the key areas where the company must and can improve and show them how that will benefit both them and their customers. She's not going to show very many slides. When I sent the slide pack I'm using today to Arthur, he said, you know you have got 40 minutes. Well, I've only had about 10 slides here and I've been talking for half an hour around them already. But Judy will use a few slides. She'll use the key ones that she needs to back up her points, the facts and figures there. And of course, she'll have all the other tables and charts and graphs in the back of her pack. So if she does get asked a specific question, if somebody wants her to really justify something, she has got the evidence there. She can bring it in when she needs to. Finally, she needs to make sure that her message is really memorable, that moral of the story. So after going through again and summarising her main points, she's going to end with a strong and vivid final sentence something that will echo in her clients' ears and drive them to act. If you can improve these three key areas, your customers will stay loyal to the brand and products they love. If not, they may love your products, but their patience is wearing thin. It's a powerful presentation. Judy's made her mark and she's told the sales director exactly 
what he needed to know. So guess now who's going to be top of the list for his next research project. I hope that you found this an effective presentation. So I'm just going to analyse what I've done to try and make it effective. Before I started, I identified my personal objective. I'd like you all to come to my masterclass. And I thought about what I reckoned your objectives would be to improve your presentations so you can win and keep more clients. And then I constructed my opening paragraph, which I wrote down and I learned. You want your clients to be impressed and excited by the quality of your research and the depth of your insight. You know that an effective presentation can be the key to winning clients in the first place and to convincing them to come to you again. So how can you turn a decent presentation into a great one? I hope today to give you some practical ideas to help you do just that. Now the fact that you're all still listening suggests I was quite successful in getting your interest there. Then I thought about what I could include that would be relevant to you and to your needs. Ideas about the toolkit and the storybook. And I hope you've been noticing that I've been using my toolkit to the full. Hopefully you could hear how I've been using my voice, using my breath control to make sure that my sentences don't tail off at the end. Using energy to emphasise points and to give my presentation impact. Subconsciously, you might have picked up the fact that I'm pretty relaxed sitting here. You won't have been able to see my facial expression and my gestures. Actually, I've been gesturing a lot. I've been moving my face a lot. You won't have seen it, but it'll have been coming through in my voice. And I've used illustrations. I've used quotations. I've used pictures. I've used examples to help make the points. I've used storytelling. I told you the story about Judy. I explained the challenge that she faces. I've told you how she was able to meet that challenge and come to a successful conclusion to reach her own happy ending to the story. So now I'm going to see if I can give you as memorable a message as Judy was able to give her clients. Great presentations take thought and preparation and practice. Great presenters will engage the heart as well as the head, using a full range of skills to add colour and interest and drama to their words, and telling stories to ensure that the message isn't lost in a welter of facts and figures but will be heard, remembered, and acted upon. Learn to use your toolkit and to tell a story well, and you and your clients will be happy ever after, enjoying a long and fruitful relationship. So I hope that you all feel that you've learned something today. If I've whetted your appetite and you'd like to learn more, I have a little special offer here for ICG members. I run masterclasses usually for agency clients where a group of staff from one agency are coming along together. But what I'm thinking of offering is an open session for any ICG members who would like to come along. It'll be a one-day course. All my courses are very practical. You don't just sit and listen to me, you get involved and you do stuff and you try stuff. We'll be looking at how you can apply the presentation toolkit to engage your audience and how you can use storytelling and language and imagery to add impact. But depending on the interests of the people who come along, I'll tailor it so we can spend more time on certain aspects that people are going to find useful. So it's not an off-the-shelf package. It will be addressing your particular needs. We'll work out the date and time once I know who's interested. Probably offer something in central London. If there are enough people in another part of the country who would like me to do this for them, I'm very happy to come 
and run the day elsewhere. So we'll see what, what kind of interest there is in that. And special offer for ICG members. Haven't fixed the price yet, but it will be somewhere in the region of 100 to 150 pounds each, depending on how many people I get. I probably need a minimum of eight people, and I could take up to 20 at the maximum. So if you're interested, and if you think that would be helpful to you, please do get in touch with me. My contact details are there. And assuming we've got enough people who would like to, to come along, we'll get a day organized. And as I say, tailor that to address your particular needs. So I think that just uh, leaves for me to say thank you very much to, to Arthur and the ICG for the opportunity of coming and talking to you today.